Good morning, church, and welcome to our sermon for May 24th. Let me invite you to open your Bibles with me as we get started to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Today we have a message of triumph. Today a message of hope. Uh, The message is, He must reign. Our Lord Jesus Christ must rule and reign over this earth because it is His duty. It is His calling and He will fulfill it. Uh, This day today is Memorial Day and uh, Memorial Day is a day for honoring and mourning the military personnel who have died in serving the U.S. Armed Forces. We, you and I as American citizens and occupants of this country, we have the privilege of of enjoying so many rights and freedoms preserved in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. These rights and freedoms and privileges have been fought and died for so that you and I can enjoy the liberty that we have today. Men and women have voluntarily uh, joined the armed forces throughout American history or been drafted into the armed forces to fight for the cause of truth and freedom. And many, too many, far too many, have lost their lives for the fight for liberty in wars and foreign conflicts. And so today is a day to remember their great sacrifice, to remember their willingness to put the needs of others before their own, the willingness not to settle for their own safety, but to fight until others are safe and others are free and others are uh, are, are able to have these freedoms. And so we can remember and honor some that we've known, some that are in our families, certainly many, many who are part of this country and its heritage. But there is one, there is one who has offered the greatest offering and made the greatest sacrifice. He was not an American citizen, but he is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was sent from heaven to earth to take on human flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh, so that He might die for His people and save them from their sins. That He might go to a cruel cross at Calvary and there uh, take on Him the the sins uh, of God's people. There He might absorb the wrath of God for our sins and die and declare, it is finished. And from there be placed in a borrowed tomb. God did not leave him there in the empty tomb, but God accepted his willing sacrifice, his sacrifice for our freedom, his sacrifice to make us free. And he raised him from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. This was Paul's gospel. This he preached wherever he went, uh, from city to city, from town to town, and right here to the Corinthians. He said to them at the beginning of this chapter 15 that you have received this. You stand in it. You believe in it. And your hope is in it unless you have believed in vain. And so I'm pleading with us this morning that our hope would be not in a dead king, but in a living king, in a risen king who reigns and who must reign, the scripture says, until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. We don't have a defeated king or a lost kingdom, brothers and sisters. We have a living Christ, a ruling king, who will one day put all of his enemies under his feet. You know, our text tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at it together. We'll read verses 20 through 28. Here's what the Bible says. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But 
every man in his own order. Christ the first fruit, and afterward those that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even to God, even the Father. Jesus Christ will deliver the kingdom to the Father. And when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign, listen up, he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, that is, God hath put all things under Christ's feet. But when he shall, uh, when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, or that God is accepted. He's not under the feet of Christ, uh, because he put all things under the feet of Christ, which did uh, put all things under him. Verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, the Father, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are all in all. How excellent is your name in all the earth. And what is man that you are mindful of him? You've made us lower than the angels, and yet you've crowned man, the Son of Man, with glory, with honor. You've sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to sit on the throne of his father, David, and to put all of your enemies, Christ's enemies, our enemies, under his feet. Lord, we acknowledge that Christ is alive and well and ruling and reigning today, interceding for us as our great high priest, standing there as the Lamb of God, uh, as the uh, offering for our sin by which you're accepted in the Beloved. Father, He is all these things and so much more to us and for us. And so we come boldly praying before Your throne of grace, asking that You would rule and reign in our hearts and through us in this world. Let Your kingdom come, let Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, guide us through Your truth today. Exalt Your name as we lift it up together and we pray that You would be magnified. In, in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, we have this study today and it's an exciting one to see that Jesus Christ is our risen King and He must reign. Scripture, Paul's words explode off of the page in verse 25, which will be our focus this morning. Verse 25 again says, He must reign until He has put all of His enemies under His feet. This is a great exclamation of truth regarding our Savior, Jesus Christ. And on this subject of, of the supremacy of Christ, the rule and reign of Christ over all the earth, for now and forever, we have uh, four points. Uh, the first, and they're all about the reign of Christ. And the first of those is the opening of His reign. Then we're going to talk about the presence of His reign. Then we're going to talk about the extent of His reign. And lastly, the necessity of of his reign. For just a few minutes, let's look at the first of these points, the opening, meaning the beginning of the reign of Christ. When did his rule and reign begin? When did it begin? Well, we can put our finger at different points in the timeline of human history, of eternity for that matter, and say that in one sense or another, Christ has always ruled and reigned over his creation. We can say that because scriptures like John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, say that the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was in the beginning with God, and, and all things were made by him, and not anything was made that was made. So all of the things that were made, just imagine all of the things in heaven and all the things in earth, from the stars that twinkle in the sky to the sands that cover the depths of the sea, even those that we cannot see. 
All of these things and everything in between has been made by God by the hand of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ stands separate above ruling and reigning over all the things that He's created. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, adds this about the creation and the work of Jesus Christ. That not only did He make all things at the beginning, but every single moment, ever since the beginning, the, the Hebrew writer says, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. By the very word of the power of of Jesus Christ, all things consist. They're held together. They're held in their place. He says, stars, stay where you are, and they stay put. He says, waves, come crashing in and go back out with the tide, and everything moves and everything is whole, held together according to the word of His power. And so based on these realities that Jesus Christ is our Creator, He rules and reigns, and He always has ruled and reigned as our Creator in this one sense. But when we look at human history and we look at the life of Christ, His death, His burial, and praise God, His resurrection, we see something unique, something changing, something opening up, even wider, even broader, something new, if you will, beginning with the resurrection. The resurrection introduces at least three new elements, three new realities to the rule and reign of Christ like there never was before. Not only does He reign as Creator, but since the resurrection, Christ reigns as our Redeemer. Yes, amen. The first way that we see this is that since the resurrection, Christ is now the God-man. As the Creator, He was God. But since He uh, was incarnated, He took on human flesh, which He never had before. He was born of a, of a woman. He was, he was uh, born in a manger. He, he took on the likeness of sinful flesh that He might save those uh, human beings like us who are sinners. Now that He's been raised from the dead, He rules and reigns as the as not only the Son of God, but as the Son of Man, the God-Man. 100% God as Creator, 100% the God-Man as our Redeemer. And this is new, and this is amazing ever since the resurrection. Also, secondly, we see that the God-Man has been declared openly as the Messiah ever since the resurrection. God has shown Jesus, His Son, to be the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen King of heaven and earth, ever since He raised Him from the dead. He fulfills the promises of the prophets and the, and the testament of old. So many of these promises are already fulfilled in Christ by His coming by His death, by His resurrection, to prove publicly now that He is our Christ and King. Uh, that wasn't so much true before the resurrection because even when He was here, even when He was born, only a few shepherds on the hillsides heard the angel's proclamation, uh, Peace be unto you, for born this day in uh, the city of David is Christ the Lord. Only a few little people... Uh, little shepherds heard that and came to the site. Only a few uh, um, wise men traveled from the east to bring gifts to him. Only a few disciples believed in him and recognized him, like Peter said, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It wasn't until the resurrection that God himself showed openly and publicly that Jesus is the Christ of God and the King of the world. Now, He is shown openly to be so. Thirdly, now He reigns. His reign over the world is not just based on the, the creative word of His power, but the reign of Christ is based on the finished work of redemption. 
His finished work of redemption for the forgiveness of our sins, which He accomplished on the cross. His rule and reign today is based on the victory at Calvary. That's what we rejoice in every time we sing the praises of our Christ and King, of our God. That's what we point to as the hope of our faith, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less, right, than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. That is the solid rock. The finished work uh, is the, the work of His a saving offering on the cross of Calvary. His reign today is a saving reign. The judgment, the, the ultimate judgment has been delayed in human history, pushed off yonder until His second coming. Now He reigns in a saving reign. Now He reigns in a day of grace. Amen? If it wasn't for this time of grace and this preaching of grace, you and I would never have been saved. We never would have heard the gospel. We never would have made it to this moment if we had been banished uh, to, the, to the throne to answer for the things we've done. But no, God in His mercy is long-suffering to sinners, calling to everyone to repent and believe in His Son, in the Son of God, the Son of Man, the mediator between God and man, our only hope, Jesus Christ. Now is the time. Now is the time to believe. Now is the time to repent. If you're listening to my voice today and you're lost in your sins, today is the day to bow before Christ, your King, your Creator, and, and give your full allegiance to Him because He is proven to be God's only Savior, our rightful King, and our only Savior. God, as I said, has declared this openly, and Peter put it this way in the book of Acts, in his preaching on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, and there beginning at verse uh, 32, he says, he says, and this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are witnesses, verse 36. And so let all the house of Israel know assuredly because it's been publicly shown through His resurrection, through these many witnesses, Paul declares and Peter declares, that God hath made this same Jesus, both whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Oh yes, since the resurrection, Christ, since the resurrection, Christ is openly shown to be ruling and reigning over all the earth. That's uh, what we're going to study on the opening of the reign of Christ. Indeed, He's always ruled and reigned, but since the resurrection, there has been this inauguration of this new and open and public and spiritual, gracious ruling and reigning in the world today that we are benefactors of. But uh, secondly, ready? Our second point is the presence of the reign of Christ. And this answers, we're answering the question, where does Christ reign? He, where does He reign? Well, after He rose from the dead, Scripture tells us that He didn't remain here to rule and reign on this earth as we would think that a king would do or should do. But, a, but our king ascended up to heaven itself, to sit there with the Heavenly Father. In fact, many Scripture passages refer to this. And Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, Paul, when he writes to the Colossians, he emphasizes this spiritual reality we, that you and I, listening right now, you and I must hold this truth as, uh, as, as present in our hearts, that Jesus Christ, who has risen from the dead, is now sitting at the right hand of God. Colossians 3.1 He's now, right now, sitting in the heavenly places at the right hand of our Heavenly Father who is all in all. He is there, even though we can't see Him with these eyes, but only the eyes of faith. Let us, Father, never forget this reality. Let us make this our ever-present reality. Christ is ascended to the right hand of God. 
But his kingdom uh, on this earth does not begin later. It doesn't begin later at his second coming. He didn't uh, uh, escape the grave and scoot up to heaven to wait one day to receive his kingdom. No, it's been given to him now. And Christ, uh, when he comes, indeed, all of those who belong to him, who have believed in him, they will be raised from the dead. This will be a thunderclap of his glory when he raises the dead and he gathers his people that are alive and remain and he transforms them into his likeness of his resurrection body and we are gathered together with him and we will forever be with the Lord. That will be an amazing sonic boom of glory to our king and we will he will be publicly over all of the earth and presently shown to be the ruler, but he is now. Even before the thunderclap of his victory, uh, <clears throat> uh, he rules and reigns today. His reign is underway now. And in this special and spiritual and gracious way, ever since he was raised from the dead, before ascending up to the heavens, he said this to his disciples in Matthew 28. He says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Right? All authority and power has been given unto me. Nothing's waiting. Nothing is, uh, is, is still wanting on the day when he comes the second time. He has all power and all authority ever since that day that he was raised from the dead. All authority has been given to me, he said. And before also, before ascending, he destroyed the powers of darkness and defeated death on his cross. It was finished on that day and it was only shown openly and publicly and proclaimed in his resurrection and ascension. Yes, indeed, Paul thinks about it this way in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, he says over there that when Christ went to the cross, that we went with him. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you risen with him through faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all your trespasses. These are those gospel truths we hold so dear. Because on the cross, verse 14 says, he was blotting out, he was covering with his blood and, and erasing the, the, the offense between us and God, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And let, and see, he triumphed over them in the cross and showed it openly when he was raised from the dead. Yes, no one can deny that Christ was raised from the dead. No one who really believes these witnesses, who was willing to believe the witnesses that, that have seen it. Uh, no one can deny that Christ has been raised from the dead. Look, Christ ascended to heaven where he sits at the Father's right hand, but he reigns here and now. Our text says back in 1 Corinthians 15 that he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. He is reigning now, that scripture is saying. And he must keep on reigning until the day when he fully and finally takes care of business. He's taking care of business now, but until he fully and finally takes care of business, he must, uh, he must reign. Take heart, my brother and sister. Take heart, lost sinner and hopeless one. Listen up right here. The enemies of Christ are the enemies of your holiness and happiness. And Christ is fighting even now to destroy them, to put them down, 
to put them out of the way, to put them under His feet, to bring them into subjection, to work for Him, for our good, to bring about the good plan and good work of God for us. He is subjecting all things unto Himself, even here and even now, for our holiness, for our happiness. And so we can know that when we fight against our enemies, the enemies of God, He is fighting with us and He is fighting for us even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when it doesn't seem like it when we look about. He is advancing in His own way, in His own time. Maybe not our timing, the timing that we want, but He is advancing and He is winning and He is putting all enemies under His feet right here and right now, beloved. That's our second thought. First, the opening of the reign of Christ. The second was the presence of His rule and reign here and now. And thirdly, the extent of His reign. The extent of His reign. And this is where we answer the question, how far does the rule and reign of Christ extend? Our text says that He reigns over all of His enemies, right? If you're still there in 1 Corinthians 15, look at our key verse again. For he, verse 25, for he must reign until what? He hath put all of his enemies under his feet. He, uh, he, he rules and reigns now, and he is putting all these enemies under his feet, and he will ultimately put them all under his feet. Verse 24 tells us what some of these enemies include. He says there that he, uh, when he cometh, he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even to the Father, when he shall have put down, and here's the enemies, all rule and all authority and powers. These same words here that say all rule and authority, Paul elsewhere says the principalities and the powers. The principalities and the powers. You've heard it, and you, you remember that phrase, right? It, it's repeated over and over in, in many of Peter, Paul's letters. When he writes to the Ephesians in chapter 1, he talks about how? He talks about this in, uh, in verse number uh, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us to believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought or worked out in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. Where did God set Jesus Christ when He raised Him from the dead? At His own right hand. Verse 21 says, Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only uh, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Christ has been risen and seated at God's, uh, at God's right hand, given rule and authority over all of the principalities and powers, over all the good and evil uh, authorities and rulers, the spiritual wickedness in high places, even over the prince and the power of of the air, chapter 2 says, and verse 2, uh, that we who were in our trespasses and sins, dead in our trespasses and sins, verse 2 says, in time past we walked according to the course of this world, according to who? The prince of the power, that same word, power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Yes, before we were born again, before you uh, believe and repent of your sins and trust in Christ, you are under the rule and reign of the prince and the power of the air. He works in the children of disobedience. He worked in you, right? He worked in me. But now that Christ has saved us and we've been born again and His Spirit dwells within us, we are under the rule and reign of Christ. Hallelujah. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And yet for this time, yet for this season, this same season of grace, 
with judgment deferred during this same season of grace, the spirit uh, of the prince of powers of the air, the evil powers and principalities are allowed to continue their limited dominion in the earth. That's where our discouragements come from. That's where our disappointments come from. That's where our uh, the dangers of corruption and sin and temptation come from in this life because of Satan's evil dominion. And we are affected by this every single day, even after we've been born again, right? And so we ask and we wonder, where is Christ? How is he letting all of this happen? He is continuing to rule and reign. And we believers are continuing to struggle against this this evil world and these evil powers. Is that, a, is that an evidence that Christ is not ruling and reigning? No! It's an evidence, and our victory over these struggles is the evidence that He is ruling and reigning today. He has not abandoned us. He is not overtaken by the evil of this world. He is subduing it. He is, has it under subjection. It is serving Him and His purposes even now, in a mystery that it's so hard for us to understand. But there in Ephesians, in chapter 6, Paul gives us this understanding as he begins to speak about our spiritual struggle and, our, and the armor of God. You know these verses. Ephesians 6.10, finally, My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because during this rule and reign of Christ in His grace and in His mercy, we must stand against the evil who is still coming against us. Verse 12, and this specifically, pay attention. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers. Yes, against evil rulers of darkness in this world. But remember, they are still under the feet of our blessed Savior, our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And He will one day put the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world under His feet. But until then, we, you and I, participate in His struggle of subduing them, of bringing them under His dominion and subjecting all things to Jesus Christ in our own lives. In our own hearts, He is causing us to participate with Him to prove His love, to prove His power in and through us, and to compel us to trust Him more, and to compel us to bring others with us under His rule and reign and into His kingdom. This is how He's chosen to glorify Himself, is that we would take up these arms and struggle alongside of Him that we might also share in the glory, in the end, when we're gathered together with Him. Paul even said that, uh, that he gloried in his sufferings along with Christ, that he might know the power of His resurrection. Christ reigns over all of His enemies, and every enemy will, most certainly will, be conquered. Amen? We must bear this in mind, brothers and sisters, when we face disease and addiction, demons and bad habits, because there is no disease, no addiction, no demon, no bad habit, no fault, no vice, no weakness, no temptation, no uh, moodiness or pride or self-pity or jealousy or perversion or greed or laziness or anything in this world that will separate us from the love of God in Christ and that Christ Himself does not aim to overcome through this loving reign in, in this world and through, and through us as we follow Him. And the encouragement in this age is that we would set ourselves to do battle against the enemies of our faith, battle against the enemies of our holiness, knowing that we never, ever fight alone when we fight in the strength of the Lord, when we fight in the power of the Spirit, the resurrection power of the Spirit, 
Beloved, Jesus Christ is now in this age putting all of his enemies under his feet and he will ultimately do it one day. We only wait to see that great glory. We've seen already three of our four points, the opening of his reign, the presence of his reign, the extent of his reign, and now lastly, the necessity of his reign. Rain. Let's look quickly at our text again in 1 Corinthians 15. Our text says, He, you get this word, right? He must reign. And He must. He must. And, and yet I wonder, where does the, the must, where does the necessity of this, uh, where does it come from? Why doesn't it just say he will reign or he does reign, but he must reign? The answer is in verse 27. The answer to why Christ must reign, the necessity of his reign, it has to happen. It has to be fulfilled. It's got to. We can rest our feet on the solid rock of this must happen. He must reign and he must put all of his enemies under his feet and he must save his people from their sins because of verse 27. Verse 27 says, He, God the Father, hath put all things under Christ's feet. The reason that Christ must reign over all of these things is because God put him there. God, the Heavenly Father, chose the Son to be the Creator, the instrument of His His sovereign will to create all things in heaven and in earth. He put all things under Him from the beginning and He put this responsibility, this privilege and this duty under Him to redeem all that was lost, to save His people and to uh, save all of creation by His blood. Purchased at Calvary. He must rule and reign because God has put already all of these things under his feet. God made his son in the likeness of sinful flesh because he once put all of these things under the feet of another man, another son of man who's mentioned. In our text, the man Adam, who represented all of humankind, his posterity and everyone under him. In fact, God created human beings in his likeness as the very pinnacle of creation, right? When you consider all the things that he made and we reach that final sixth day of creation, what caps it all off? What made all of his creation very good that there at the top, that there set over all of the other works of his hands is man himself, created in his likeness and in his image to rule and reign over all these things. If you don't believe it, read it over there in Genesis and find that he placed him in the garden and over all of things to dress and to keep it. He put things under the dominion of man, under Adam. But Adam fell from that place. He fell from the pinnacle. He fell from having all these things under him and he was crushed beneath them and crushed beneath the weight of his sins. And he died the death that God promised. And so do you and I in Adam. Verse 22 says, For as in Adam and Adam's transgression from having all of these things under his feet and Adam all died. But God in His sovereign love said to the Creator Himself, while man could not do it, you can. And so come. Come into your creation. Come into the likeness of that sinful flesh. Come into the place of the new Adam, the, the, the second man, and stand for your people. Stand with all of your enemies under your feet and redeem your people from their fall to sit and 
to stand with you over all the creation. That's why Paul can proclaim in verse 22, not only in Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. Beloved, Christ is the only one who can uh, save this lost and dying world. He alone stands with everything under his feet because God has put everything under his feet. Christ will return one day to earth and he will gather his kingdom and he will deliver it up to God publicly. He will honor the Father for this great privilege, for this great gift of of standing over all of the creation, over all of the enemies, over all of his people. He will then turn and give that great kingdom, that great gift back to, to God because he is all in all. He will put all of his enemies under his feet, subdue them and destroy them and cast them once and for all, Satan and his evil angels and the the unbelievers of mankind into the lake of fire under the feet of the heavenly Father to his glory. And then as verse 28 here says, that he will then, when all things shall be subdued under him, that he the Son also will subject unto him all things that are unto him. He will subject himself unto the very God, his Father. He will sit down beneath him and make God all in all. The necessity of Christ's rule and reign is so that he can make the glory of God greater, so that he can point all glory to God the Father who has placed this honor upon man, who has placed this honor upon him. For every knee will bow one of these days, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, not to the glory of Jesus, but Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the King of all, to the glory of the Father, the glory of the Father. And Jesus Christ loves to give glory to the Father. And so should we. We will do it with Him for all of eternity. For all of eternity that in the heavenly city we will have no need of the sun. No need of the moon or of the stars to shine upon us. As Revelation 21 says, For the glory of God is the light. And the light is the Lamb our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ Himself. We will join with the Lamb and sing, Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and power because Thou hast been slain and has been raised from the dead. And we will join with the Savior, bringing glory to God, who is all in all for all of eternity. And so this Memorial Day, as we pause to remember our fallen heroes of the United States, those who have risked their lives and given their lives for these values that we hold dear and the freedoms that we enjoy every day. Let us not forget the memory of our Savior. Not only that He has died for us, but that God has raised Him up, that He must rule and reign over us today. He is giving us freedom. He is giving us liberty in this day of grace. He is extending that grace to you, lost sinner, to you, beloved, calling you to draw near to Him, calling you to humble yourselves and subject yourself to Him, calling us to struggle with Him as He puts all of His enemies under His feet. We are never alone. We never fight alone. And the victory is ours. How do we know that we overcome these enemies? The the victory is our faith. By our faith in Him, we overcome the world. Today I urge you to bow before Christ. I urge you to fight your battles with the armor of God and the strength of the Lord and know that one day Christ will put all of His enemies, your enemies, under His feet. I pray that God is honored by this message of truth today and that you are encouraged as I have been 
to study and make so much of the name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ, and our great God, who is all in all. Until we meet back together again in, uh, in, in conference videos or in worship videos like this, may God bless you and comfort you and strengthen you to stand with Him. God bless us.